So that is starting now, and I am going to hand things over to Janet um, to kick us off. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Hannah. And thanks, for everyone, for joining us tonight. Hopefully, by the end of this presentation, you'll be more comfortable in talking about climate, the science of solutions, and what is going on in Virginia that um, requires attention. So uh, this is... Um, this is the first picture of the Earth fully illuminated that most of us ever saw. Uh, it was taken in 1972, and it's a picture from the Apollo 17 mission taken as the crew was heading towards the moon. And um, I think it was very impactful because it showed both how interconnected and how small the world really is. This is called the Blue Marble, and it's one of the most famous uh, photographs of all time. So. When we think of the sky, we think it's a vast and limitless expanse, and it really is not that way at all. So what you see on this slide, that thin blue line, is um, the atmosphere. This was a, a shot taken from the International Space Station, and, uh, and this, it shows the sun coming up between the troposphere and the stratosphere, the two layers of the uh, lower atmosphere. Uh, if you were to drive your car straight up into the air at highway speeds, you would be at the edge of the atmosphere in about five minutes. So we're talking about a very thin shell. Next. The problem is we are, we are putting man-made uh, global warming pollution into this thin shell at the rate of 152 million tons every 24 hours. So you saw how, how thin that shell was, and we are – um, polluting that permanently with carbon dioxide, but other greenhouse gases as well, such as nitrous, ox ox nitrous oxide and um, sulfur. Next. So uh, here's the basics of um, global warming, and this is something scientists have known since the 1800s. Solar radiation from the sun uh, warms the Earth's surface. It's, it's absorbed by both the Earth and uh, the ocean, the ocean actually takes in about 90% of that heat. Uh, much of it is reflected back from the Earth's surface. However, part of it is uh, reflected again back to Earth by the atmosphere. This is a good thing usually because it keeps our Earth at a livable temperature. Uh, however, the problem uh, arises when too much CO2 and other greenhouse gases get concentrated because it, it serves to thicken the atmosphere and more of the ongoing, uh, I'm sorry, more of the outgoing radiation is trapped. Next. There's a number of sources for global, uh, for man-made pollution. And this uh, shows a number of the major ones, uh, transportation, both air and land, industry, and also power. So our electricity needs, whether uh, via coal or uh, or renewables or something in between. But the main uh, cause of rising pollution today is the burning of fossil fuels. Next. So this is a graph uh, just to show numerically uh, what we're talking about. So transportation is now at 29% of the emissions uh, it just surpassed electricity at 28. So in the past year, transportation has, has actually become a, uh, a higher source of emissions than any other uh, sector. Industry comes in a distant, a distant third. Next. So we wanted to tie together what we're going through right now, um, the coronavirus pandemic and how it's related to climate change because it's, um, it is related in a number of ways. The main one being that they are both health issues, especially if there are any underlying respiratory or immune um, deficiencies. And often people don't realize climate change is a, is a health impact, and we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, both both uh, issues show how interconnected we are. We saw the coronavirus literally coming our way from China and Spain, and you know, we kind of watched it cross the globe and really were not able to do much to stop it. Uh, we need to be prepared before it's a crisis. I think we've seen we've been very reactive in the United States, which hasn't served us well. And with both climate change and, and the coronavirus, uh, we need to be proactive. With, with climate change, since we know so much about it, 
there's really no reason we aren't proactive. We need to trust science and data. Uh, we saw in the beginning of the coronavirus, the scientists were, were dismissed. The same thing happened with climate change, and, and uh, thankfully it's not that way anymore. Uh, in both cases, we're more successful if we act globally and not in a silo. We need to be able to share what we learn with other countries and to learn from them. Next. So coronavirus and climate change are specifically related in this way. In, uh, in last year, 2019, two ice cores were retrieved from Tibet. One was 520 years old and the other was over 15,000. Between those two cores, 32 ancient pathogens were covered. Four of those were known, but 28 had never been seen before. And we know that with melting glaciers and uh, uh, you know, other um, ice caps uh, melting, we're going to be seeing more and more of these ancient pathogens. The thing with viruses is they are not alive. So they require a living cell to activate and to reproduce and they can stay in a state of suspended animation for thousands of years. And they like to do that in cold, dark, anaerobic environments, such as permafrost or deep ocean sediments. So it's, it's a matter of when we're going to see the next novel virus because it's, it's coming our way and we need to be prepared. Next. Uh, the largest source, of global warming, as I said, is the burning of fossil fuels. It, it still provides over 80% of our world's energy today. And we, you can see that it really took off after World War II as industry began to, to ramp up. Um, and I know we're hearing people say that because emissions are down right now, because everyone's staying home, it's great for the environment. And while it's good for the environment, absolutely, and we need to continue that, um, the, the, all of the CO2 and greenhouse gas, gases that are out there right now mean that our actual uh, measurement of the dangerous gases in the environment has continued to go up over the past couple of months. And that is through something known as um, parts per million of CO2. It's measured at Mauna Loa, Hawaii, at an observatory there. It's really in the middle of nowhere. And uh, it has slowly been inching up. It's currently at 417 parts per million. And about 50 years ago, it was at 320. So you can see it's, uh, it's been inching up quite a bit. Next. Um, as, as these gases are trapped, it is, it's leading to warmer temperatures. And this shows, uh, especially over the last 40 years or so, how much the global surface temperatures around the world have departed from the average. Next. In fact, 19 of the 20 hottest years on record have occurred since 2001, with our last five years being uh, the most impactful. 2016 was actually the hottest of those last five years. But you can see that this is a, a very recent problem that we're having. Next. Heat itself is a problem in many parts of the world and in many parts of this country. This is a gentleman who succumbed to heat stroke uh, in Boston. So heat affects not only people, but animals, crops, and our weather. Next. So here's a graph of global ocean heat content. And the, um, the lightest blue layer there is the surface of the ocean down to 300 meters, which is a, about 1,000 feet. Uh, if you go all the way down to the dark blue at the very bottom, that is uh, to 2,000 meters, which is roughly um, a mile. So uh, the heat has the ability to permeate quite a distance into our ocean, and that leads to a lot of problems. Next. Uh, specifically, so this was the path of, of Hurricane Harvey in 2017. And as the uh, hurricane crossed the Gulf of Mexico, which is relatively shallow, uh, it warmed, the, the warmth of the, the Gulf, which was seven degrees hotter than normal, 
allowed this tor- tornado, this hurricane, to just get stronger and stronger in intensity. And in fact, uh, generally storms decrease in intensity as they near the uh, shoreline. But here, uh, since it just kept getting warmer and warmer, it allowed this monster storm to develop. Next. The same is true for 2018 and, and Hurricane Florence which was able to um, become very strong, very powerful, have very high winds, and, uh, and then made landfall in the Carolinas, leading to um, massive dem- uh, devastation. Next. So this explains the hydrological cycle or the water cycle. So, and this happens over and over and over again. Uh, water evaporates into the air, forms clouds, they drift over land, and fall in the water that has evaporated, uh, falls as precipitation, either rain or snow. And when it lands back on the ground, depending if the, if the water there, if the ground there is already saturated, we will see mudslides and flooding occur. It just becomes um, such a, a vicious cycle. Next. So this is an actual photo of a um, supercell over Kansas. And as the world's getting warmer, the extra heat increases the evaporation, intensifies these storms, and we get these tremendous downpours that scientists are calling rain bombs. You may have heard of a snowfall or rainfall that is termed a once in 100 year or once in a thousand year event, which historically was accurate. But what we're seeing as everything warms up, more of these storms are developing. Um, Perhaps you remember in Ellicott City, Maryland, over the past uh, three years, they saw two of these one in 1,000 year events. So they're becoming uh, more regular and increasingly devastating. Next. And it seems counterintuitive to think that we're getting both more uh, heavy rains, heavy storms, and um, we're seeing more problems with, with drought. And the problem is it's, it's the same heat that is evaporating water from the ocean is pulling it out of the land. So it's causing longer and deeper droughts, which lead to some problems of their own. Next. Particularly in in crop yields, so rice, corn, soybeans, uh, often these very dry, barren areas uh, become uninhabitable. And um, as the CO2 levels increase in the air, it also makes it harder for these plants to grow. Next. We know that warmer weather typically leads to more fires. This is a graph showing the correlation of hotter years with more fires. And this is in the Western United States. Um, and you, you know, I'm sure we all remember what's been going on in California where the fire season has extended more than 100 days. Next. And uh, here's a, a very scary photo of one of the fires out West uh, with climate change we're seeing higher winds, which tend to fan the flames, just exacerbating the problem. Next. The insurance agency has told us, we're measuring how many extreme weather catastrophes we're seeing every year. And it's broken down by colors. You can see, uh, actually everything is increasing. Storms on the bottom in gold, floods and mudslides, and extreme temperatures. In the last two years, we've had some of the most expensive uh, losses due to extreme weather ever. In 2018, it was $160 billion of losses that were claimed. And in 2019, it was $140 billion. Next. Okay, this is a, uh, a glacier in Greenland from summer of 1935 to less than 80 years later. Um, where it's, it has melted, NASA precisely measures the declining ice mass in both Greenland and Antarctica. So it, it, you can see the power and, and how quickly 
uh, we are seeing things like this happen. Um, any declining ice mass pretty much goes directly to sea level rise. Next. Okay, so that was rainy day flooding in, uh, I'm sorry, sunny day flooding in Miami Beach, Florida. There were no storms that day. This is just a, it's a natural occurrence now as groundwater has no place else to go. And it begins to come back out of the storm drains and uh, leading to uh, situations like the one you just uh, saw in the video here. Um, one problem that's happening, so this is in any coastal region around the world, and uh, one problem for Jakarta, Indonesia, they are sinking six inches a year and have now decided to relocate the entire city to Borneo. The only problem with Borneo is that they are struggling with wildfires. So you can see that um, finding a good place to relocate uh, is going to be more and more of a problem as there are less um, safe places to live. Next. So this shows where uh, in the United States uh, we are most at risk to rising sea levels, and this is by population. Six of the top 10 uh, states that are at risk are on the East Coast. Number one you can see is Florida with uh, 1.8 million people in danger. Maryland comes in at, at number six with a little, little over half a million people, and Virginia is right behind that. Um, at number eight with just under half a million people. So it's, you can see on the, the shot there of Delaware and the Chesapeake where all the flood zones are. And um, so it's going to be a, an issue that we need to be proactively addressing right now. Next. Now this slide shows um, the average number of flood days per year in selected cities. And the orange graph to the left, you see the orange and purple graph. The orange graph shows the average number of flood days in the 1950s. And the purple graph next to it shows the recent number of flood days. And, you know, you can kind of scan quickly and see uh, where, where we're really uh, having issues. Wilmington, North Carolina, which was hit by uh, Hurricane Florence, Lewis, Delaware, um, Atlantic City, you kind of expect the coastal places, but if you look, um, Baltimore, D.C., and Philly are on here as well. So, you know, they're on bays or they're not directly in the line of fire, but um, also very uh, prone to flooding. So overall, the average number of flood days per year has increased from five in the 1950s to 30 today. Next. So this is a warning from the Department of Defense. Climate change will lead to food and water shortages, pandemic disease, which we're seeing right now, and disputes over refugees. So, you know, often people think that uh, people only become refugees due to wars, but many wars are caused by not having enough food or water, uh, you know, having to flee from places that are just not habitable. Next. Climate change is a medical emergency. Uh, infectious diseases, heat, stroke, pollution, waterborne illnesses, they're all influenced by a change in climate and not in our favor. Next. So this slide shows the spread of tropical diseases. So if you can see the initial uh, circle with the asterisk in it shows where that uh, illness, disease, originated and then how quickly it was able to spread north and south. Um, almost all of our asterisks are right on the, uh, to the tropical zone line. And um, as we get warmer and warmer, these uh, diseases are on the move. So Zika has been one that uh, we've particularly been focused on lately. Next, which is caused by this guy, uh, mosquitoes, and they also spread dang dengue and yellow fever. They're able to cover a wider range in a warmer, wetter world. Next. 
This is a golden poison frog, and it is one of the uh, species that is at risk of uh, being extinct. And we are currently at the risk of losing up to 50% of all of our species in this century. This would be the largest mass extinction since the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Next. Uh, oh, this is, a, this is not a filtered shot. This is an actual photo. It's called a polynocalypse in Durham, North Carolina last year. And what we're expecting to happen is if you have allergies out there, it's only going to get worse. The uh, amount of pollen in the air by 2040 is expected to be three times what it is today. So this was made, this pollen uh, in the picture was from pines of, uh, of central North Carolina. Next. And in fact, over 9 million deaths are attributable attributable to ambient air pollution per year. And you can see the uh, darker oranges and darker reds show where it's worse. In the United States right now, we're in the range of 20,000 to 50,000 deaths just due to air pollution. Next. More than half of the people in the United States are living in counties whose air does not meet EPA air quality standards. I wanted to show this in case, um, you know, for, since it's a local problem that we had, St. George, Delaware, which is just below the um, uh, Pennsylvania line, uh, last year over Thanksgiving weekend had an ethylene oxide leak, which is a very dangerous chemical. The Atlas plant is a chemical plant very near the Delaware River. Next. And this aerial shows just how close it is both to the Delaware River and to communities on the left-hand side. So this is when we get into environmental justice issues as well, where the, uh, the uh, industry that is doing the worst job of polluting is often located near disadvantaged um, neighborhoods. So that's a, a large environmental issue, environmental justice issue. Next, please. Okay, so uh, this is a number of the issues. Currently, uh, the cost of carbon that we, we didn't really go over, uh, but the World Economic Forum is calling it the number one threat to the global economy. Okay, and now I'd like to hand it off to Natalie Pien, who is both on our board of directors and a former environmental scientist herself. Hey, Natalie, you're muted if you're talking. Okay, I just got unmuted. I was a host for- Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, now I can talk. All right, sorry about that, everybody. Um, thank you, Janet. So fortunately, um, we've got solutions available to us now, namely renewable sources of energy. Here's wind energy installation projections and reality. Next. This is what it looks like in terms of a graph. It's an exponential curve. Next. Wind energy could supply 40 times more electricity than the entire world currently uses. Next. This five turbine, 30 megawatt offshore wind farm is featured in the Block Island Tourism Guide. Tourism has gone up since installation of the turbines. Another positive feature, the turbine bases on the ocean floor serve as artificial reefs for marine. Did you know that cats and office building windows kill more birds than turbines? Next. 
Solar, solar energy has an even more dramatic story. <coughs> next. Whoops. No. Yes, next now. Here's what it looks like in terms of a graph. Like wind, solar is experiencing exponential growth worldwide. Next. The cost of solar, like computer chips and cell phones, has fallen dramatically. In some regions, generating electricity from solar energy is less than half the cost of using coal. Next. In many countries where there's no electrical grid, consumers and businesses are leapfrogging old technologies and installing solar panels in places that have long been denied access to electricity. Next. Chile is a true solar success story, thanks to its policy decisions. The country's solar market took off slowly, but look at what is happening now. There are many regions in the world where this type of growth and development are possible. Next. In the United States, new electricity generation is coming from solar and wind while coal is just about gone. Moreover, today, producing electricity from solar is cheaper than natural gas. Next. Solar energy can meet the world needs, solving the climate crisis while simultaneously helping local economies. Next. Battery storage is an essential part of the green energy revolution. Here's the historical growth of battery storage as well as projected growth. Did you see that the y-axis changes from three gigawatts in the historical graph to 1,000 gigawatts in the projected growth graph, that's huge. Batteries allow storing excess solar or wind energy and use it during times when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. Batteries are also critical for the electric vehicle market. Next. Within the next eight years, highly efficient LED lights are predicted to virtually take over the market. Energy efficient technologies like LEDs keep the money and help to reduce emissions by cutting down on the amount of electricity we use. Next. All these automobile manufacturers are now offering or preparing to offer electric vehicles. This is another part of the sustainability revolution. Next. Almost 200 global companies have made the same commitment to go on energy. And now many of them are putting pressure on their subcontractors to do the same thing. This is partly because customers are saying, hey, we don't want to do business with companies that are not committed to helping solve the climate crisis. This shows that what you choose to buy makes a difference. Next. In December of 2015, at the Paris climate negotiations, every nation in the world agreed to phase down greenhouse gas pollution to, meet, to net zero emissions as early in the second half of the century as possible. Climate action isn't just about what countries do. We all have to take the lead on climate. Corporations, states and provinces, and cities are committing to reduce emissions. Next. We're seeing marches and demonstrations and demands at the ballot box for the changes necessary to solve this crisis. Next. Here's the current status of the 2015 Paris Agreement. This coming year, all countries that ratified or signed the agreement committed to reconvene and examine how the newly cheaper sources of renewable energy, electric vehicles, and efficiency improvements will allow them to make even bolder pledges. Of course, President Trump announced withdrawing the US from the Paris Agreement. But remember, under international law, the first day the US can legally withdraw is the day after the presidential election. 
So the American people will still control this decision. Now, let's take a look at climate issues in Virginia and what can be done to reduce greenhouse gas emissions called for in the Paris Agreement. Next. So in Virginia, in Virginia we have issues like sea level rise, data centers, um, new fossil fuel infrastructure, and pipelines, Atlantic Coast, the Mali Mountain Valley Pipeline, and a new project. We'll start with data centers. Next. Today, we live in an information age. Through the use of a computer and the internet, any topic under the sun can be researched, obtaining written information, graphics, and video. Cloud computing makes it possible to access information from any device anywhere. Did you know that the cloud is not up in the sky? Actually, the cloud is on the ground in brick and mortar data centers that operate 24 seven to provide online browsing, streaming, and communications. All this requires a tremendous amount of electricity. Next. The internet is a critical component. Did you know that Northern Virginia is the heart of the internet with more data centers than anywhere else in the world? In fact, 70% of global internet traffic passes through Loudoun County's data center alley every single day. That's more than, there are more than 70 data centers located in Loudoun County. Next. Technology companies with a presence in Loudoun are familiar corporations. Apple, Amazon Web Services, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Salesforce. These corporations have committed to using 100% renewable energy for their operations. Apple, and to a lesser extent, Salesforce, Facebook, and Microsoft power their data centers with renewable projects. But the vast majority of data centers in Virginia are not because they are located in Dominion Power Service territory. You may be asking yourself, how does Dominion generate electricity? Next. As you can see, Dominion generates less than 4% of its electricity from renewable sources of energy. The majority of electricity is generated from nuclear and gas, followed by coal. Dominion doesn't even plan to increase its use of renewable sources of energy. Next. On the contrary, it wants to build the Atlantic Coast Pipeline to transport frack gas from West Virginia to generate electricity for data centers. This shows the 125 foot cleared pipeline right of ways that scars across the landscape. Heavy equipment used to uproot living trees, laying the pipe in the ground. Next. This graphic is packed full of information. First, the map shows the orange path of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline starting in West Virginia, cutting through Central Virginia on its way to North Carolina. Second, the cost of the pipeline is now $8 billion. It will be paid by Dominion customers, AKA ratepayers, by adding more than $30 each month to electricity bills. Shareholders, on the other hand, will pocket 14% guaranteed profit of the cost of building the pipeline. The climate impact is huge. The ACP will have greenhouse gas emissions equivalent to that of 20 coal-fired power plants. Moreover, building the pipeline will keep Virginia on fossil fuels for decades to come. We know from the 2018 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that there are less than 12 years to aggressively address climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Two years have gone by without significant actions in the US. This map also shows the location of three compressor stations needed to push gas through the pipeline. Each compressor station has been sited in a marginalized community. In West Virginia, the Lewis County compressor station is in a poor white community that has already been subjected to fracking fields. In Virginia, the Buckingham County Compressor Station is sited in the Freedman founded African American low income community of Union Hill, where the majority of residents are elderly and children. 
in North Carolina, the Northampton County Compressor Station is located in the 100% Lumbee Native American community. Clearly, this pipeline is an environmental justice issue. Next. There's a lot of different groups opposing the Atlanticus pipeline, each for its own reason. For example, technology companies oppose Dominion Energy using data centers to justify building the pipeline. They also want more renewables and less natural gas from Dominion. Next. Communities in the pipeline fight for their health, their land, their life, property rights, and justice. Virginia Interfaith Power and Light elevated the environmental justice issue for the Buckingham Compression Station proposed in Union Hill. Thankfully, the good news is that the permit for the compressor station was recently revoked. The bad news is that the Supreme Court heard the case from Dominion Energy in which they contested a lower court decision to overturn the U.S. Forest Service permit for the ACP to cross the Appalachian Trail on federal property. property. So in other words, Dominion did not like the federal court ruling so they took their appeal to the Supreme Court. And it is highly unusual for the Supreme Court to hear a case of such narrow focus. Next. Environment organizations seek to protect Virginia's natural resources and environment, as well as promote a rapid transition off fossil fuels to clean renewable sources of energy. Next. Loudoun residents living in the Ashburn districts near data centers are routinely subjected to harmful air pollution from both short weekly testing of the diesel backup generators and monthly extended testing. Building frack gas infrastructure like pipelines isn't consistent with Governor Northam's September 2019 Executive Order 43, Renewable Energy Goal of 100% by 2050. Next. So decisions and choices must be made. Do we continue business as usual? Or do we take action to ensure a rapid transition to clean renewable sources of energy? Time is running out. If we don't act now, we won't have a choice except to suffer the full existential consequences of global warming and climate change. Thank you. This concludes my part, and I'll turn the program over to CCAN Virginia organizers, Lauren Landis and Hannah Lowe. Thank you. Next. Thanks so much, Natalie. Let's continue the solutions discussion and cover a few more important climate change facts using Hampton Roads as a case study to demonstrate why these solutions are so crucial. The national importance of Hampton Roads and its parallel risk of climate change effects cannot be overstated. Next. As most know, the military presence in Hampton Roads distinguishes it as a vitally important global and national hub. We are home to the largest naval base in the world and the only NATO command on US soil, and the region is very dependent on de upon Department of Defense spending. Next. And of course, Hampton Roads is a crucial part of the Chesapeake Bay region, home to vital aquaculture. Hampton Roads ranks in the top 20 seaford, seafood ports in the nation and much of the economy is linked to this industry. Next. As you can see, there are many bio and industry waste threats to this ecosystem in particular. These different categories of pollution link directly to the solutions that we'll be talking about in just a minute. And I'll just give you a moment to review those different segments. Next. The stats associated with the climate change risk of Hampton Roads are equally dramatic. Hampton Roads is second only to New Orleans in terms of population centers at risk for sea level rise and coastal climate change impact. Next. Hampton Roads is at a 96% risk of a five foot flood within the next 30 years, according to the Surging Seas Risk Finder. Additionally, $370 million of residential properties are at risk of yearly flooding by 2050. 
These numbers are shocking some people into action, and now we'll talk about some of the solutions Virginia is pursuing. Next. <coughs> Virginia is slated to spend $4 billion on mitigation and adaptation against climate change. You'll see on the screen now several different categories where we're targeting our efforts, and I just want to call out a couple of important points. The first is the historic Virginia Clean Economy Act, which CCAM was heavily involved in passing this year. The VCEA mandates that at least 73% of Virginia's electricity come from clean energy by 2035, and 100% a 100% goal by 2050. The VCEA is also forcing fossil fuel companies to abandon fracked gas infrastructure in favor of clean infrastructure, such as the largest offshore wind project in the country, which is currently underway in Virginia. In fact, the wind turbines for this project ship from Denmark at the end of April. Another important piece of legislation is HB 75, which launched an electric school bus pilot program to shift the focus to clean transportation in Hampton Roads. Next. The adaptation methods that you see here focus on adjusting Virginia's physical infrastructure to better match the threat posed by climate change to our geography. Techniques such as raising roadways and reducing paved areas will all help stem the rising water on streets that Janet mentioned earlier and produce climate change responsive cities. CCAN is pursuing these mitigation and adaptation measures through coalitions across the state, such as the SAVE Coalition and the Virginia Coastal Alliance, as well as upcoming policy goals and petitions and actions that each of you can be on the lookout for and take part in. Next. Now I'll turn it over to Hannah to discuss the ongoing pipeline fights in Virginia and how CCAN is working to stop fracked gas. Awesome. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so earlier in the presentation, we heard Natalie talk about the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. Um, thanks, Natalie, for doing such a great job explaining that. Um, and she told us about the devastating impacts of pipeline infrastructure in Virginia, from increased emissions and continued reliance on dirty energy to the environmental justice issues that are associated with the pipeline itself and compressor stations. Um, so today we have an action to finally try to kill the ACP once and for all. Um, tomorrow, May 6th, there's a Dominion shareholders meeting, and we're going to deliver a petition with over a thousand signatures um, to Dominion CEO Tom Farrell. So we need your help to convince the CEO and every Dominion shareholder that the ACP would do more harm than good. So I'm going to ask you to do two things that have to do this. First of all, I want you to sign um, the online petition. So you're going to be able to find that in the chat box. Someone should be posting the link right now. Um, so go ahead and click that and give it a sign and we'll add you to the names that are being submitted with this petition, um, asking them to abandon the ACP. The second thing I'm going to ask you to do um, has to do with that piece of paper and something to write with that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, we're asking all of you to make an anti-Atlantic Coast Pipeline sign, take a beautiful photo with it, and tweet it at Dominion Energy. Um, and Dominion Energy's Twitter handle is literally just Dominion Energy. Um, so if you don't have a Twitter, feel free to email that to me at hannah at chesapeakeclimate.org, um, which I'm asking if somebody else could also put my email in the chat box, that would be awesome. And CCAN will tweet it. Um, but if you have your own personal Twitter, that's even better. Um, so take that no ACP sign. Um, doesn't have to be super creative. Um, I think just like a picture of yourself with it will make a huge impact. And a bunch of those um, tweets in conjunction with the petition, um, I think will make a big splash tomorrow. Um, so for the sake of time, I am going to let everybody work on that as we transition into the Q&A in a couple of minutes. Um, but as you're thinking about wrapping up here, think about uh, signing that petition and also um, taking that photo with the no ACP sign um, and tweeting it as a minute energy. Um, unfortunately, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline is not the only pipeline issue Virginia is facing. Um, there's also the Mountain Valley Pipeline and the Header Injustice Project, which um, some people that have been familiar with the pipeline fight in Virginia might be a little less familiar with the Header Injustice Project. Um, it's the newest proposed project, and it's 24 miles of proposed pipeline, um, and then three compressor stations, either expanded compressor stations or new compressor stations. 
Um, it's all over Virginia, from Northern Virginia to Central Virginia to Hampton Roads. Um, I'm not going to ask you to submit comments to the SEC right now. They told me that I had to stop asking you guys to do stuff um, right now, but I'm going to ask you um, when you get a follow up email with all this information, we're going to send you the link to submit comments to the SEC. Um, and I just encourage you to go ahead and let the SEC know what you think about um, increasing pipeline infrastructure in Virginia. Um, the deadline for comments was actually extended to the 12th. And so since we have that extra time, we really want to get as many people as possible submitting comments. But like I said, concentrate now on getting that no ACP sign and tweeting our and um, tweeting that sign and then also signing our petition. Um, and like I said, keep on keep on working on that uh, throughout the presentation. Um, just a little bit of encouragement for anybody that might have a little bit of petition fatigue or tweeting fatigue. Um, there's something called the theory of 3.5%. Um, this is a study by Erica Chenoweth, who is a political scientist at Harvard. Um, in her research, she found that um, in serious political movements, only 3.5% 3 of the population needed to be actively participating in order for real change to happen. Um, and she actually stated that change appears to be inevitable once 3.5% of a whole population actively participates. Um, and this was actually specifically for nonviolent um, protests and social movements. She found those to be more successful and the 3.5% rule applies to that. So maybe you can't get you know, all of your friends to sign this petition or to start getting involved with climate change, um, fighting climate change. But I think if we can get to that 3.5%, um, it's a real possibility that we can make change and that we can stop this before it gets worse. Um, so just a little bit of inspiration there. I know we can all kind of, um, especially now, maybe stop being as optimistic about, about the world in general, but we can do things. Um, and I think this Harvard political scientist agrees. Um, so I'm just going to leave you with something kind of a similar idea, um, which is that the majority of Americans who um, who acknowledge that climate change is real, they hesitate to talk about it. Um, so social scientists and climate um, communication experts identify that talking about climate is the single most important thing everyone should do. Um, and so towards the beginning of this uh, webinar, most people said that they were pretty comfortable. And if they weren't comfortable, they were, you know, neutral about talking about climate change. Um, and so all of you guys should be talking about climate change with all of your friends, all of your family, even if it's a difficult conversation. Um, there's really no way this can be changed if we're shying away from that conversation um, because we need to get more people on board. Um, so as you're sitting here, think about who can you can pledge to start a climate change conversation with. When are you going to have that conversation? Um, what common values and issues can you use to start the conversation? Um, and how can you link climate to those common values that you might share with somebody? Um, so it really starts by talking. Um, and I know we have a good group here that will are probably already pretty dedicated to doing that, but just to, to reaffirm that that's something that we should all be doing. Um, so with that thought, um, we are going to now switch into the Q&A portion of the presentation. Lauren is gonna take over um, and she is going to conduct a couple of poll questions and explain how um, the Q&A is going to work. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Thanks so much, Hannah. Um, yes, y'all should be seeing um, the poll pop back up. Um, on your screen right now. Um, so I'm gonna give just a few seconds for everybody to retake that, um, just like Hannah talked about. Um, I hope that y'all uh, got a lot from the information I have watched or ran through or listened to this presentation, I think three or four times now. Um, and it is still impactful to me every time. So I hope that um, y'all found it to be the same. Um, I think we're still letting some people run through oh it says the poll is gone already gone i am still seeing it if you participated in the poll i think it'll temporarily leave your screen mm. so while people are doing that i'm going to um, explain how we're going to do the q a <laughs> um 
really quickly. So first I'm going to be going through the questions um, that have stacked up in the chat and just running through those and either answering them if I can or calling on some of my teammates to help me out with that. Um, please feel free to continue to submit questions as you think of them um, while we are doing that. Um, and then once the questions that have already been submitted in the chat have all been gone through and answered, if anybody has just some ad hoc questions or thoughts that came up, um, please feel free to raise your hand um, in the participant list, raise your hand electronically, and I'll go through and call on people um, and unmute them. Um, so with that, I think we're going to go ahead and run through some of those questions. Um, let's see. So a first one that um, I'm calling easy only because I literally just Googled the answer um, because I didn't have any knowledge about it, but I thought was a really interesting question was um, asking for a little bit more clarification um, from, I think, Austin on how pollen amounts are related to climate change. Um, so first, I'm just going to answer that by reading a couple things that I found just in some quick Googling before any of my teammates pop in with more expert knowledge. Um, so these two quotes and facts are from climatecentral.org and nrdc.org. Uh, the first is researchers do not fully understand the cause of the upward trend in allergies, but one thing is clear. As humans warm the atmosphere, the freeze free season generally begins earlier and lasts longer each year, extending the time during which plants can grow and produce pollen. Similarly, researchers have already recognized that ongoing climate change can alter allergenic pollen biology in several ways. Warmer temperatures fueled by climate change can mean longer pollen seasons, more pollen produced, and more intensely allergenic pollen. Um, so hopefully that is at least some helpful just intro information. Um, again, I'll pause for any of my teammates to offer some more expert knowledge, but I found that to be very helpful just to see that literally there's just more time for pollen to grow and to be even more potent with the warming earth. Um, Secan teammates. <clears throat> I'm getting thumbs up. I think we're going with the science. <laughs> Great. Um, and just a quick pause. Denise is going to go ahead and share the results of the new poll before I move on to the next question. And you see them popped up right there. It looks like we have 74% who are very comfortable um, telling their friends and family why they need to act on climate change, which is great. That's exactly what we want to hear. Um, totally sympathize with the people who answered three and four. It is a tricky conversation um, and hopefully arming you with facts and information like we've done tonight will just help make it easier. Uh, let's see, moving on to, and of course, if anybody has follow-up questions after we answer a question, please feel free um, to put that in the chat as well. The next question that we had was, um, a couple of questions about pipelines. So from Aaron was asking for clarification about whether or not the Supreme Court had heard the case yet. I believe Aaron was referring to the ACP, but I'm not 100% confident. So Aaron, if you want to unmute yourself and clarify, but if that was the question, um, I think we're looking for just a little bit of an update on the ACP and Supreme Court progress trajectory, which we may need to get back to you on, but we'll I'll pause here for a moment. Hey, Lauren. Um, Hi, Harrison. A, a quick update is that they did hear the case. We're waiting for um, the verdict. It may come in June, but I don't know how things are delayed with uh, COVID. Gotcha. And we just have one more question and then we're going to get to some on air questions next and I'll re review how to raise hands. Um, so the last pipeline question was um, within the last two to three weeks, the Virginia pipeline projects have experienced new legal and structural problems slash setbacks. What are the next steps to get this development stopped, blocked and closed? Um, so I see that it says, what are the next steps to get this development stopped, blocked, and closed? However, as Hannah mentioned, there are several different Virginia pipeline projects. Um, so I, I'm, I'm guessing that the answer to that is probably multi-part. There are several different decision makers that CCAN is targeting to get various fracked gas infrastructure projects in Virginia shut down. Like Hannah talked about, one of them, the Header and Justice Project, we're targeting 
the SEC um, in terms of getting comments submitted um, and in terms of hearing participation coming up in the next week. So I'm sure that the answer, um, if any of my other teammates want to jump in, is going to be we're taking a lot of different steps, both legal um, and grassroots. Anybody else want to chime in? Hannah's giving me a nod. And we can follow up more specifically if you want to um, maybe email Hannah. Her email is in the um, chat box. It's hannah at chesapeakeclimate.org. Um, if that, I know that that was kind of broad, but that's because there are a lot of different things that we're um, using to stop those developments. So feel free to email her um, and she'll be happy to get you a little bit more information if you wanted more specifics. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so now we're going to go ahead and take some live on air questions. So don't forget, you can raise your hand. Um, all you have to do to do that and I'm sorry, I'm in the admin part of it, but you should just be able to go to the participant list and raise your hand next to your name at the bottom. There should be a little button that says raise hand. Um, and then once you've been called on, you'll also need to go through and manually lower your hand so that we know that you don't have another new question that it's your hand being raised previously. Um, so I'm just going to scan through. Oh, we've got one right there. Sandy, go ahead. I'm going to unmute you. And I, oh, thank you. Hi, I'm I'm here. I'm delighted to be here. My brother is active with climate control or change up in New Hampshire, and he said recently, Michael Moore has put out a dreadful film that really <laughs> underscores a lot of what we need to be talking about with climate. Has anyone else seen or heard of this film? Thanks, Sandy. Um, I have heard of it um, and I have um, read some articles about it. I haven't actually watched it yet, so I am probably not going to be the best person. Has anybody else from CCAN actually watched it and want to speak to Sandy yet? I can regurgitate what press has said, but that's not really a primary mm -hmm. source. Um, this is Natalie. Um, I started watching it um, on Earth Day. Huh? And it was so depressing. I couldn't finish watching it because, you know, usually Michael Moore has excellent, well-researched fact uh, documentaries, but this was not. There were some things that I thought that didn't sound quite right, but the over Im overall impact was so negative. I just couldn't watch anymore. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's been a lot of critiques afterwards. Um, pretty much discounting um, the documentary, that it really wasn't a documentary. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Dolly. Uh, Sandy, I'm going to go ahead and mute you again, and I lowered your hand for you. Um, I'm just scrolling through. I can just add it, it just really briefly. Um, I also haven't watched it. I've heard that it's probably not actually worth watching it. Um, I've heard, yeah, it's, there's, there's a lot that's not right and detrimental to the movement. Um, so if you want to know more about why you shouldn't watch it, I just pasted uh, a Vox review about about the movie. So I would recommend if you're going to pay attention to it, pay, pay read, read some articles and and spend your time watching something <laughs> better. <laughs> I agree. Thanks. Um, okay, let me give me just a moment to scan through. I'm looking for raised hands. I don't see any right off the bat. Um, not seeing any. Um, while people think about their question, I'm just going to circle back to one question that was mentioned. Um, we did have a question to review the part about ice melting leading to the release of frozen pathogens. I want to say that that was okay. covered in Janet's part at the beginning. Yeah. Um, so maybe Janet could super briefly just sum up the mechanics of that while I keep scanning sure. through raised hands. Okay, absolutely. Um, yeah, what happens is the viruses have the ability to lie dormant for thousands of years. So as um, glaciers melt or polar caps melt, um, and sometimes, uh, uh, you know, if there's anything, any animal or person in that 
uh, ice, they're also going to, um, you know, thaw out. And um, between just things, you know, new, whether it's coming from, a, uh, you know, an animal or just being unleashed by the ice, these viruses, if they have anyone, um, any kind of a, a live cell nearby, they can uh, take in, you know, go into it and, and start to reproduce. So the problem is that they, you know, they like these cold, uh, no oxygen, dark places and can can subside there for thousands of years. So that when they say it's a novel virus, it just, you know, it's novel. It's nothing that we've ever seen before. Does that Perfect. help? Yeah, thanks, Janet. Um, okay. Let me see. I don't see any raised hands, so I'm just going to grab a couple of other comments and questions. We did have a question about um, mm -hmm. yeah. Norfolk well, specifically. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to see. Oh, that may be me. Oh, there's, oh, a, there's a physically raised hand, not a, <laughs> looks, looks like. No, oh, sorry, I'm not screaming through the pictures. So, well, go uh, ahead. Should we go to Walt? Yeah. Yeah, I want to know. Um, that's nice and hypothetical about those uh, pathogens being released by melting, but have there been any actual examples of it? Well, in the, um, you know, what I said on the slide, that the two ice cores that they checked had 28 pathogens we had never seen before. Um, I can but certainly give you I can play of, my references. But have there been any mm -hmm. examples of, of infection due to that? Otherwise, it's still hypothetical. Well, I, I, I believe that there are actually, Walt, and I'm, I'm happy to find some. Um, I don't recall seeing like anything in particular that said it caused a plague, but I, I do know that they've said that some of these novel viruses are coming out that just weren't known before. But I, I'll, I'll look around for that. There, I think there's something about that. And I'll, I'll get that to you. So I'm not seeing any raised hands in the list of purchase. Oh, Sally and Russ, go right on ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. OK. Um, the, the situation with the Domin Dominion Energy seems so hopeless to try to get them to change. <clears throat> But then I, when you were talking about the new laws in Virginia for uh, renewable energy, that seemed like that would put pressure on Dominion to, to have to change to renewable. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Um, hey, I'm happy to answer that. I'm Harrison Wallace. I'm our Virginia director. So I uh, do a lot of the policy work for CCAN. Uh, but yeah, the answer to that question is yes. Um, you know, Dominion just released their IRP uh, on Friday, and it's it's definitely not perfect. But what we saw is that uh, last year Dominion planned to build eight new gas plants um, over the course of the next 15 years, um, and almost double their carbon output. And with that one law, their new outlook has them reducing their carbon output about 20 million tons. Um, you know, building enough solar panels to power 3 million homes and enough wind to power another million. Um, and that's just from one year of having a legislature actually wants to take action on climate. So it's definitely possible to push them. It's not going to be easy. And they'll find every way possible to, you know, not do what they're supposed to. But in just one year, you know, we've completely shifted their business model. So I think, you know, if we keep working together, we'll we'll get it going even further. Well, that's hopeful. That's help. That's a good, good direction to be going. Thanks so much, Harrison. Um, before I scan through looking for more raised hands, we just had a couple of other questions um, stack up that I want to get to before before I forget about them or before they think we've forgotten about them. So one question was: Is Norfolk thinking? A statement and a question. Norfolk is sinking too. Which is contributing more, sea rise or sinking? So my very unprofessional opinion um, is that definitely it's both. Um, I do have a little bit of information from a recent study that was done by NASA where it was trying to get a really good picture of um, <clears throat> 
different areas of Hampton Roads and how much was sinking and how much was sea level rise. And basically the results were that it is definitely both and it changes dramatically within just a few couple blocks or miles. So one area in Hampton Roads might be the sea level, the, the rising flood waters might be more contributed from from land sinking and then just a couple miles over it might be because of sea level rise and that could be due to what was being built in that area how much is paved in that area whether or not um, sediment and soil was pulled away because of a project building in that area so while it is definitely important to know what uh, factors we're talking about whether it's land sinking or sea level rising Ultimately, it kind of doesn't matter um, just because either way, the mitigation and adaptation measures that have to be taken have to be taken no matter what, um, whether it's caused by land sinking or sea level rising. So we still have to be cognizant of whether or not we're building too close to the water, whether or not we're building in soft areas, whether or not we're paving too much, and kind of the way that we got there doesn't matter as much as the steps that we take. Um, Again, this is just very elementary information that I have learned. I'm not a scientist, um, but it is definitely both. And obviously land sinking um, is a little bit different than sea level rising, but the, the measures that have to be taken to um, mitigate that tend to be kind of the same. Um, is that helpful or does anybody else want to chime in? I know Harrison did my job for several years and is, um, has a lot of experience in Hampton Road, so he might ha have something to add. This is Natalie. I'd like to add something. Um, I remember learning a while ago that um, the land subsidence has everything to do with climate change as well, because the, um, I guess what I was reading is that it's kind of like a seesaw. At uh, one end is the Hampton Roads area that's going down, and at the other end is the polar ice caps. So as that mass melts, mm. there's less mass um, and the other end of the seesaw is sinking. In addition, as the polar ice caps melt, that's actually, you know, adding more volume to the oceans, which is causing sea level rise. So it's really so interrelated. But I agree with you, Lauren, that the um, how we mitigate and how we how we adapt, it's, it's, it doesn't really matter what's causing it. Yeah, okay, great. Hopefully that's helpful. And of course, um, this is definitely a very Hampton Roads uh, centric topic. So always feel free to email me lauren at chesapeakeclimate.org. And I would love to do more research and we can talk about it more. Um, just a couple more questions before I shut this stream a little bit and look over at people's raised hands. Um, and I see your hand wall and I'll get right to you. Give me two seconds. Um, one quick question was, does CCAN have a preferred carbon tax and or dividend? And I do not know the answer to that question at all. And I think we will be getting back to that Lauren, question. could you repeat the question? Oh yeah, of course. The question was, does CCAN have a preferred carbon tax and or dividend? And, and I, I think that that's coming from, um, I know Citizens Climate is um, advocating for 763, HR 763, which is the uh, energy innovation and carbon dividend. Um, I don't know. I honestly, I, uh, I've not seen CCAN take a stance on that. Um, I don't know if the organizers or Harrison know more. So we, I mean, we've, you know, we were big proponents of joining Reggie, um, which mm -hmm. is a market-based program. Um, we are involved in <clears throat> the Transportation Climate Initiative, which is a market-based program around transportation emissions. I, I don't know where we stand on uh, the federal level, but I, I know Mike has been involved with Citizens Climate Lobby and, and, and supports them. So. I think as long as it's equitable and leading to larger emissions, it's something we consider, but I don't think we have a preferred method. Great, thanks Harrison. And then one last one before I jump to Walt. Um, 
there seems to be a lot of contradictory information about the portion of greenhouse gases attributable to meat agriculture. Should we not be telling people that it's the biggest thing they can change? Many of the other groups seem to long to a much higher percentage. I'm not 100% confident about the last sentence of that, but I think it's just generally a question about um, the culpability of meat agriculture and how powerful and how much we should be focusing on that message. Just for me personally, um, I'm a vegetarian for many different reasons. Um, and I generally agree that that is something that, you know, we can definitely tell people. I don't know personally the data and the science on a hard and fast fact. I know that there are lots of organizations that I myself follow that are doing just that. They are telling people that it's the biggest thing that can change. I personally have no problem with that. I'm not confident that that is really the wheelhouse of CCAN, speaking as a Hampton Roads organizer, just personally, that's not, meat agriculture is not what we are focused on. Um, I also know from a personal standpoint and from raising a child, there are a lot of different messaging and communication ways that I am trying to convey when I'm talking to people and teach my child that yes, that is a huge change that people can make, but not everybody can make that change. Um, there are people out there that um, don't have that option for a lot of different reasons. And I, again, not speaking for CCAN, just me personally, always wanna be very careful um, assigning a lot of moral higher ground to one solution over another without knowing what everybody's individual situation is. So that is just me and I will step off my soapbox and see if anybody else wants to talk mm -hmm. about meat agriculture. The only thing I'll add to what Lauren said is that <clears throat> if you ever go to a CCAN event, there will not be any uh, animal products or at least there won't be any meat present. Um, we're, you know, all of our events are vegetarian. Um, and you know we believe in in you know practicing what you preach there. But yeah, there's you know consumers are a part of this, but we're focusing on the big polluters, the big corporations who are really driving climate change. Um, so if you're able, I think it's always great to eat less meat. But um, it's really you know if Tyson Foods are what's making this bad, not you eating a hamburger. So I think that's what we have to keep in mind. Great, thanks, Harrison. I'm gonna give it a second in case anybody else wants to chime in on that. And then I'm going to go ahead and scroll over to Walt. Thank you for being so patient. Unmute myself. Here we go. Yeah. Um, being in Southwest Virginia, I'm more uh, concerned with Appalachian power than, than Dominion and more concerned with the Mountain Valley pipeline than, than the ACP. And I'm a little disappointed that there's no mention of that, of either of those situations in this meeting. It is part of Virginia too. Well, I know Hannah mentioned the MVP. We've been active on that um, and we'll continue to fight that pipeline. The Virginia Clean Economy Act also uh, binds Appalachian Power to the same uh, guidelines as Dominion. So 100% clean energy. By 2050, they only have one power plant in Virginia and that will have to shut down by 2050. Um, and then any energy they get from the state will be clean. So uh, we, we are thinking about y'all and trying to figure out how we can make sure that the whole state is benefiting from this. Yeah, thanks Harrison. Um, I just wanted to add to that as well. Um, the actions that we that I've gone over are kind of the things on the grassroots side. A lot of the pipeline fights for the ACP and the MVP are happening in courts right now. Um, so there's, I think a lot of the actions that have to do with the Mountain Valley Pipeline are monitoring um, the stream crossings that are going on and, and seeing if there's any, you know, violations or constructions that are going on. Um, so we have our eye on the MVP and there's a lot going on with in the courts right now with that. Um, and I'd be happy to talk to um, Anne, our, our lawyer who can kind of give me the breakdown on that if you wanted more information on that you might already have it but I just wanted to speak a little bit to say that um, we haven't forgotten about it um, by any means um, but a lot of the action on that is you know in courts right now as well and while I'm talking and when I'm talking about the pipelines and I'm sorry to bring it back to the Atlantic Coast pipeline which is kind of the issue you brought up 
but I was debating whether I should show you guys this um, just because I didn't want to intimidate anyone with my creativity. Uh, but if you're looking for inspiration on your sign, um, this <laughs> is mine. <laughs> um, I think it's the point across. I'm, I'm not sure if it's backwards for y'all or not. Um, but this is my sign and I will be tweeting it at Dominion Energy. So just a little bit of a reminder um, Thanks, that I think it'd be really cool if everybody could do that. Thanks. I don't have a Twitter account, so I sent mine to you, Hannah. Thank you. Amazing. So I'm just scanning through. I don't see any physical or virtual raised hands. The only loose end that I think I can see um, is it looked like there was a little bit of an exchange between Bill and Wendy, and it looked like Wendy was asking if we have a stance on something, but I kind of got lost in the chain, and I'm not sure what what stance we needed to clarify. So Wendy, if you want to pop in and unmute yourself and make sure that we get your question answered if we can. Uh, you guys have already covered it. Uh, that was the HR 763, which um, for those of you who are looking for um, systemic kind of change, I would recommend investigating it. I'm also a climate reality um, graduate and kind of came back from that and wanted to get involved with more systemic type change rather than just, you know, what I can do as an individual. So, um, and that's, I was just curious if you guys ha had um, a preference, but thank you very much. It, very, very good presentation. And I will do my no ACP for sure. So thanks. Perfect. Thanks, Wendy. Lauren, um, just, just a yes, quickie, Lauren. Course. Yeah, um, of course. Just for future reference, how do you virtually raise your hand? I don't understand that. Oh, sure. No worries. Um, so you should be able to click on participants. Do you see that menu option at the bottom of your yeah. screen? And then when it, when it pops up, you should have a button option that literally says raise hand and has a little tiny picture of a hand. My screen looks a little bit different. So please, someone correct me if I'm giving the wrong instructions. Is that working for you there? No, no. Hmm. The only thing I can also think of is sometimes Zoom gets a little glitchy if you haven't updated to the most recent um, version, but I am not a tech person, so I unfortunately might not be able to help much further than that, but at least for us, when in doubt, no, you can no, always physically no, raise your hand. No, it came up. No, I oh, see Oh, good. It. Oh, perfect. Look at that. I just had to stall and I could figure it out for you. Um, Mindy, you raised your hand. Go for it. I was just going to say yes to open the chat box in order to see it. Yeah. Thanks, so. Mindy. Um, so I'm scanning through. I don't see any other physically raised hands or virtually raised hands. So I think we have covered everyone's questions. I hope we have. Um, I don't believe I'm the one that's wrapping everything up. I think I'm going to turn that back over to Janet, but thank you so much for your thoughtful questions. And of course, please always feel free to email um, either Hannah or I, both of us. It's just our first names at chesapeakeclimate.org. Um, and if we can't answer your question, we'll get it around to one of our other teammates that are on um, the call with us. It's just easiest for you just to have to remember our two organizer emails. Um, so thank you again. And turning it back over to, I think, Janet, the awesome architect of this presentation okay. to wrap so, things up. Okay. Great. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you all for your participation, both within CCAN and everyone who joined us on the phone. Um, this uh, presentation actually came about from a, uh, an earlier uh, Zoom call, uh, maybe a month and a half ago, where some CCAN supporters said that they were interested in a, um, a presentation on climate change. So let us know what it is you want to hear about and, um, and we'll make it happen. Okay, we're doing this again tomorrow night for the state of Maryland. So um, please let your uh, you know, friends and neighbors know about that. And hopefully you're more comfortable now talking about climate change. And if so, we've done our job. So thank you all so much. I, I'm so sorry to jump back in. I just see one little thing that says, is there a follow-up planned? I wasn't sure if that meant another event. Like Janet said, um, there is another complimentary event for Maryland tomorrow night. Um, and we also are planning to do similar um, events um, every Tuesday night for the foreseeable next few weeks. Um, so you should have probably seen a calendar item um, with different options coming up in the next few weeks, please just email either Hannah or I if you needed more of that. 
and I think the slides will also be shared to participants later. And again, please remember to um, take action on that poll and tell three friend, friends about climate if you're looking for a follow-up that's more action-y, um, if that's what the question was referencing. Yes, the follow-up is please tell three friends about um, what you've learned about climate change mm -hmm. and how they can take action. Thanks, everyone.